welcome if you're joining for the webinar, Building Youth Resilience, How Invisible Work Shapes Stronger Futures. All right, if you're trickling in, we're going to get started um, in just a sec. Welcome to the webinar. We're glad that you came, glad that you're here for a wonderful conversation today. Um, you're at Building Youth Resilience, How Invisible Work Shapes Stronger Futures. So again, welcome. So for what we're going to be diving into today, um, first, we're going to be talking about resilience frameworks and how resilience frameworks can be a tool to inform youth focus work. Uh, second, we'll talk about how resilience framework actually brings to the forefront some of what I like to call the invisible work of supporting, serving, and coming alongside young people, in particular around building trust and relationships. And third, we'll be hearing from our wonderful panelists who are here today, sharing diverse perspectives um, from the nonprofit sector, as well as philanthropy and policy work, and really hearing about um, boots on the ground to support youth resilience. Next slide. And a warm welcome from our company, Community Science. I like to say that our name is in what we do. We really use science, rigor, and data to support and come alongside communities using research, evaluation, um, technical assistance, and um, data and capacity building in general to help communities change the things that they want to change and also to help to continue to strengthen what um, communities say is strong locally. And that includes coming alongside young people. Next slide. All right, and as we get started, I will share an introduction for myself and I'll also ask my panelists to share an introduction. So I'm Brandy Gilbert. I'm a senior associate at Community Science. I lead our youth engagement and youth leadership focused practice area at Community Science. And I will also ask um, each of our panelists to share one thing that's exciting them. One thing that's exciting me is that our um, youth team at Community Science recently released a report with um, Connecticut Opportunity Project and Dalio Education focusing on the experiences of young people who are ages um, teens into young adults and focusing on experiences around disconnection from school and work. And what does it really look like to have connection and have support and um, thinking about systems engagement as well and intersectionality. So that's some really powerful work that's being used in foreign policy, especially um, in the state of Connecticut that we're excited about. And next I'll pass to Sheree to share a little bit about your work and something that's exciting you right now. Thanks, Brandy. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Sheree McWilliams. Um, I'm a policy associate at the Annie Casey Foundation. We are a national organization based in Baltimore, Maryland, um, and I support our child welfare and youth justice policy work um, and some of our youth engagement and youth leadership work uh, alongside my colleague, colleague Alex. Um, and one thing that I am excited about is um, the upcoming anniversary of um, Chafee and some of our partners who are leading a national campaign um, focused on not only reflecting on the last 25 years of um, extended foster care and how young people are faring as they transition to adulthood, but what the next 25 years should look like. Um, and so we're going to be helping out with an event um, with policymakers this December. Great. And I'll pass it to you, Alex. Thanks. Good afternoon or good morning, everyone, depending on where you are. My name is Alex Lorbach, and I get to work with Sheree at the Annie Casey Foundation here in Baltimore. Um, and I am situated in our unit that focuses on child welfare, and my portfolio specifically focuses on youth engagement and youth leadership as it relates to older youth who have experienced foster care. Um, I like to say that I have one of the best jobs in the foundation, but just one thing that I'm excited about um, and is a shameless plug that we are launching a new curriculum set to launch in February called Elevating Youth Engagement, uh, which is really designed for young advocates and their adult partners and allies to really support them in building a strong partnership together, strong relationships together so that they can really move systems change. And I'll pass it to Diego. Thank you, Alex. Uh, my name is Diego Uriburu, and I'm the proud co-founder and executive director of Identity, a nonprofit in Montgomery County that works with Latino youth and other historically underserved youth and their families. Um, we do a lot of youth development. We, we reach around 14,000 young people every year, plus their families. And I'm very proud and excited to come to work every day because I, I witness 
uh, how with, the, with, with the right support at the right time, how young people thrive. Yeah, thank you so much. And thank you to our panelists for sharing. Next slide, please. All right, so I'm gonna share just about four or five slides before we hop into some great discussion with our panelists. Um, first, talking about resilience frameworks. So here, this is lots of visual uh, to take in, but we'll be sharing our slides later. Um, and also housekeeping as well. Feel free to share um, any questions or comments in the chat that's full time. The chat will be open. We'll all be able to see it. And if by chance you would like to show caption, closed caption, you can um, find the bottom right hand bar to um, click that. Um, but we'll be sharing materials and all of those things later. Uh, so here's a resilience framework. Um, one of the materials that we'll be sharing is a blog that I wrote over the summer. And our vice president asked me a question at the top of this year and that my background is really in sociology and disaster research and um, asked me like, oh, are you gonna go back to doing disaster research? Like you seem to be so focused on the youth side now, like what happened? And that sparked me to write this blog where I talk about the bridge for me, really, for my early work on disaster research, in particular, focus on youth to how I see myself more and now at the thriving youth, youth engagement, youth development space. And one of the core tenets there, I think is helpful for all of us in the youth engagement and thriving youth space is resilience frameworks. And in um, my disaster work, there were zillions of resilience frameworks. Some of my favorite are from RAND um, and also Community Science. We built one that kind of builds on RAND and some earlier frameworks. And so the, um, the, the reason why they're helpful is because they think about youth engagement and youth resilience from really backing up and thinking about the big picture. So sometimes in our youth focused work, I tend to notice that we're so focus on problem or deficit narrative and really flipping that on its head and thinking about what does big picture support or resilience really look like for communities and for young people in particular. And at Community Science in our work, we see that as having three major components with data kind of just going across that really. So one is community strength, thinking about what, it, how do young people build sense of community? Where does social capital fit? What does collective efficacy look like? And all of those things are buildable. So again, you have these um, negative sort of mental model models and frameworks and narratives about, you know, where the state of young people are and all of those things can be built and become more robust. And young people also have them. They're already strong. Um, second is equity, justice, and wellness. So thinking about what does equity mean? How do we um, have access to more fair opportunities? Also, how do we think about well-being, both social well-being and economic well-being? And lastly, infrastructure. And I think of infrastructure could really be resources, time, funding, all the things that we're putting into our work. And so all of those are really levers. And there are many elements of community resilience where if we really step back, we can think about how to support young people in a much bigger way and also keeping community context in mind. So that's one reason why I see resilience frameworks as a powerful tool. The other tool is having my background in disaster research has taught me about, and I'll have the next slide, please. Resilience frameworks often um, talk about bouncing back better and bouncing back from what, you might say, is usually resilience frameworks divine um, stresses, uh, chronic and acute stressors. And so uh, acute stressors can be things like what I studied early on. So like Hurricane Katrina, the BP oil spill, human cause and um, weather cause disasters. And then on the other side, you have chronic stresses, which many of us today, judging by the information you shared with us and signing up for this webinar are on that chronic stress side. And so are we at Community Science is thinking about things like food insecurity, engagement with the juvenile justice system, housing instability. And so resilience frameworks really help us to understand how both chronic and acute stressors sometimes combine and collide. One example is communities in North Carolina that were recently hit by hurricanes at the end of September. We also work with um, foundation part and community partners there who are working on lots of chronic stressors but are now also facing acute stressors. And we know for young people when those things collide or even chronic stress on its own or acute, you're seeing mental health, emotional health, academic, physical, and social and behavioral health. So again, really thinking about what is the big picture structure of how we understand how we situate youth-focused work. 
And those are two reasons, so um, where we see a community science resilience frameworks as really a helpful tool for us. Next slide. Um, the other component that we really like about resilience frameworks is in that first box with sense of community and social capital. So those frameworks commonly bring to the forefront work that is really critical for supporting youth resilience. And so we have a model in the next slide, but what that model really shows is sometimes as program providers, funders, policymakers, we might jump right to what are the services and what are the problems. But really before that, you have the need to build the social capital, the relationships, and all the things that build the foundation before you're actually moving into programs. So that's first understanding the strengths and needs of young people. Where are they in their journey? How do you meet them where they are? Also, how do you really sort of build out your program in a way that I like, um, Diego, what you said in one of our earlier prep sessions, that trust is transferable. And so how do you build trust and also recognize that trust can be transferred and so that you can sort of build that trust even with even more young people to help build services. And lastly, oftentimes, this is the work that's invisible. So what we see is that the work that's on, funded on paper is commonly um, those services. So connection to workforce, connection to education. And we might see some of like the wraparound services and things in there, but what we've been hearing from across our projects, many partners that we've talked to is really like the pushing and talking about what does it take to do that work well? And many more of us becoming conscious of that. Next slide. And so here's our last slide before we'll shift to our first question for our presenters is um, that invisible work. So thinking about, and I wonder for you who are joining us today, think about, do you have invisible work in the efforts that you either drive or support? What are the ways that we can use data, tracking information, whether that's from young people themselves or from the people who provide or support the programs? of really shedding light on what that invisible work is. And of course, it can be other things too. The resilience framework is big. It takes a lot to make communities resilient. But um, talking here, one example, a concrete example of that is the building of relationships and social capital as a piece of what is commonly um, some of that, uh, that early work that is often invisible. So when you think about that little green person, that is where support and service delivery is happening. But often what it takes to get there is the building of awareness, how you grow that awareness, how your messaging, how that messaging is resonating or maybe not resonating with young people also connecting with early needs. So we're also often seeing with our partners we work with is sometimes the need is not what the program serve, but recognizing that you have to overcome sometimes basic needs. So access to documentation, access to housing, and those services are becoming more and more embedded in the programs that support young people. So again, this is looking at some of those steps is what could be invisible? How could we bring it to the forefront, especially if we know that it allows us to do our best work coming alongside young people? And so now I'm going to take a pause and share. Next slide, please. Um, actually, before I take a pause, I do want to end on one note is that I also share my blog is in addition to these learnings that we talked about here, what we see across many of our projects is hope. Um, is hope, it keeps coming up. Um, and despite um, whatever young people might be facing, there's still strength and there's still hope. So for instance, in our study, when I said what I'm excited about when we interviewed over 74 teens and young adults experiencing disconnection from school and work, almost every, if not every, I actually believe every interview, young people were asked in the end, what are their goals for themselves? And each time they were able to articulate what their, what their goals were and who was driving those goals and for what reason, which was often is taking a stand for themselves and for their families. And so Hope is strong in these stories and in the resilience story. And also the evidence shows that when hope is in place, that our health is better, our social emotional well-being is better. And that is scientific, that's like not a nice to have, but actually scientifically proven. And so I want to end on that note before I um, transition to some questions with our panelists. So I'll start with the first question. And if we could have that question in the chat as well is that, and we can pull the um, slides down, Andrea, and pin us all now, 
and you all can look out for that question in your chat. It's, out, it's already there. Okay, so our first question is about invisible work. So I've asked our panelists to talk a little bit about, um, given that social capital is key to fostering youth resilience, how do you see youth supporting organizations and funders playing a role in building strong, supportive relationships for young people? What can we do to ensure that invisible work, like relationship building, and um, consistent well-being checking, relentless outreach is another example, receives the necessary attention and resources alongside of service delivery. And I'll pass to whoever wants to start off on our panel. I'm happy to jump in. Sure. Um, all right, yeah, okay, this could go in so many different directions. So I'm really excited to, to dig into this. Um, I wanted to, just, I, I know I mentioned this in my um, intro, but wanted to just contextualize my work because I think youth engagement as a term sort of means different things in different spaces, right? And so mm -hmm. in my role, I'm more so talking about engaging and partnering with young people to create macro level systems change regarding, um, in our case, primarily child welfare systems, right, that they've experienced and that, that may have harmed them, right? Um, and I think about this work, my work as two pronged. So some external facing work. So supporting organizations to do this work. And then we have our more programmatic arm. So we run a youth leadership program and, and support a network across the country of young advocates with lived experience in foster care. And so um, I'll sort of speak from that like youth leadership and youth advocacy lens. Hopefully it resonates beyond that. Um, but that's that's sort of where where I'll situate this. And uh, the notion of invisible work really deeply resonates with me. Our team talks about it all of the time for lots of different reasons um, because it's a huge lift, right? Primarily is one of those reasons that it is a lot of work to do the work of relationship building. Um, and, and it is work to be taken seriously, right? Like I always think about um, what we know around adolescent development now, right? So um, this idea that because our brains are so malleable when we're young, that no interaction is neutral, right? But that I've, actually every single interaction has an impact on developing brains. And that really compels me, and I think should compel all of us to, to take our interactions and our relationships with young people really seriously, because they're a place to, um, they're a place to practice a lot of things, right? Um, we grow and we learn in the context of relationships and we get to practice setting boundaries, working through conflict, um, discovering our goals, unearthing our values, and like really being in interdependent relationships with one another, right? Like we're talking about like a bilateral relationship, right? It's not just sort of adults doing young people a favor by showing up for them, but actually young people enrich our lives too, um, in lots of different ways. And that's, that's a lot of the work, um, I think a couple of things that I'll just name in addition um, under this umbrella of invisible work in the context of youth advocacy work that we do, there's a lot of work to get to know the young leaders within the context of their experience in foster care, right? Because that's sort of the shared experience. That's our common goal around advocacy, but while also holding and affirming that young people are more than really painful things that have happened to them, right? And so figuring out with them, like, what feels safe to share in the context of advocacy work, um, thinking with them, how does that change over time? One thing you may have wanted to share publicly that moves a piece of legislation in your um, home community might not feel safe anymore two years down the line. Um, and sort of thinking through the work that goes into supporting young people to like share and advocate from their scars, not their open wounds, as one of my colleagues says. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's that's one piece. And I think the other piece that I'll just lift up um, is back to that interdependent relationship piece. Like there's a lot happening with adult supporters and practitioners in this work too, right? Um, that we that folks are carrying, um, and we need to ensure that people who are supporting young people are also well, right? And also cared for. Um, I think this is true across the board, but I think it's particularly important um, when we think about the growing wave of like credible messengers and peer navigators or folks who have otherwise um, similar lived experiences to the young people that they're supporting. There's a lot of layers, right? In the supports that um, 
practitioners need and need to be tended to in, in really intentional ways. And I think there are um, lots of opportunities for organizations to, to be thinking about that creatively and certainly funders to be sort of intentional about how are we supporting the invisible work that makes this whole thing that makes all this magic happen on the ground, right? Um, and so I know Sheree was gonna sort of think a little bit more from the funder's perspective, um, but yeah, I'll, I'll stop there. Yeah, no, that I, I, I think that really beautifully like encompasses a lot, right? And I think, um, Brandy, you also mentioned, you know, in your intro, right? That like in many youth serving systems like child welfare, well-being, you know, the idea of well-being is really only measured usually by access to services, right? Yeah. Um, or, you know, um, outcomes um, around service provision and things like recidiv recidivism, right, um, or discharge rate or like things like that. Um, but I think a lot of opportunity exists for systems to actively promote and support a fuller concept of well-being um, beyond just service delivery and, and service provision, right? And so, I think also, you know, we as a collective in the field, right, and I'll also speak, you know, from a funder's perspective, right, that we should be pushing, I think, to measure outcomes based more on youth, family, community, well-being. Um, and so I think, you know, to the extent that funders can try to shift and sort of disrupt some of the more traditional funding models and structures and um, give organizations, youth serving organizations, more flexibility um, and, you know, sometimes more time, right, in, in the way that grants are structured, because we know that authentic, being in authentic relationship with people takes a lot of time. And, you know, um, one of my colleagues likes to say that, like, um, relationships move at the speed of trust, right? And you can't, you know, manufacture, um, you know, artificially trust, right? It's something that you have to do and put time into. Um, and so I think, um, you know, I think that's one thing I'd like funders to keep in, in perspective and also just, you know, the evaluation and metrics part, right? Like developing metrics that really can speak toward um, and speak to the impact of authentic relationships that um, make it e easier to demonstrate their value um, to funders and stakeholders and, and doing that, right? Developing those metrics and, you know, measures in partnership with young people, right? And asking them um, how they define well-being. Um, and, you know, sometimes asking them questions like, you know, do you feel like an equal partner at the table? Do you feel like your voice is is being heard um, in, in these processes? Yeah, for sure. And what does that mean? Uh, sorry, Dave, I was just gonna make a quick inter uh, addition what does that feel like? Like we've asked those questions, um, you know, what does it feel like down to where young people have said like, oh, when we're integrated, like we'll be in a shared intergenerational space and like we won't be sitting at the back. Like it's very specific things when you get down to, you know, what does success mean? Um, thank you for sharing both of you. Uh, Diego, feel free, please. So from a youth service perspective, the invisible work needs to happen if you if the program is going to be successful. If you budget for it, uh, uh, if you don't, you have to do it. So in terms of, of funders, people need to explain to them you know, why is it important. And then you have to budget it into your timeline. If you're going to have a program that your outcome is workforce development or educational attainment or whatever it might be, you know that you need to budget time no, at the beginning of the of the program in order to, to build these trustful relationships. You'll be able to hire people that really care. Uh, young people can smell fake a mile away. So you have to invest in people that really care, uh, that are trained so that you can understand that the, the, the beautiful dynamics between, between really caring about these, these young people and at the same time understanding that that to care means to set boundaries and that they will respect you more and want you more if you set the boundaries. But those need to be established a little bit into the relationship, not at the beginning. So there's a lot of work that that uh, that it's involved in, in this in, in invisible work that if funders are not aware, it's the responsibility, our responsibility as service providers to make them aware. 
again, to budget for its cost and also for the time. Uh, because uh, if we don't do it, the programs will not will not work. Yeah. And Diego, do you have any additions or thoughts about um, what does it take to budget for that? So I know multiple partners that we work with have talked about their journey and understanding and being able to really quantify. For instance, like likely it takes us seven touch of outreach or we likely outreach for months before people roll into our program participation. Or we've even seen some of our partners are like, we will serve in the wraparound services for like unlimited time and over time people opt in. But like I, I've seen partners just get better and better with that data of like, what does it look like so that we could all get on board better? Well, it really depends. Mm. It depends on, let's take identity as an example. We've been around for 26 years and the community really knows us. So for that, that is an accelerator. No, when, yeah. when we go to provide services, the parents know and the parents tell the young people, depending on the ages also. Elementary schoolers don't have much much of a choice. So the parents send them and, and it's the, the the caring charisma of the youth development specialist not mm -hmm. to engage. If you're talking about youth, older young people, 20, 21, 22, 24, that be involved in the juvenile justice system, um, Alex, you were talking about experiences, no positive, and negative. Many of the young people that we work with have had many negative experiences, and and it takes an inflection point in order to build those relationships, and they are distrustful. So mm -hmm. it takes one time, two times, three times. They purposely sometimes sabotage the relationship, the relationship to see if you're going to be there for them or not. They test you; you have to follow through. So it really, it really depends. But if you're an established organization, then it takes a lot, a lot less time to do it. If you are a university that wants to run a program and you have no connections, then then you have to budget for a lot more. Um, so it really, really depends on on who the young people that you're serving are, how they come to you. Do you partner with someone that has to trust and they're going to refer them to you and they're going to be part at least the first two three months in order. To, to, to that trust to transfer genuinely and uh, genuinely. Uh, it really, there are many, many variables, but each each organization should know his or her environment and and their assets in terms of their relationship with the communities they're trying to serve and make judgments based on that. Thank you. Thanks. So now we are collecting a couple of questions in the chat, which we'll, we'll revisit. Um, we may also ask some people if they feel comfortable to share their questions and speak um, out loud with us, um, if you're okay with that. So question number two um, will also be coming up in the chat is about your work. So what specific strategies for the panel have you found effective in supporting young people manage the stressors and build resilience? What other strategies has your organization used to help young people build resilience and overcome the stressors they face? And in our prep, Diego, we uh, talked about how you might be the best one to kick off this question as a nonprofit being on the front lines of building resilience and providing direct services to young people. Well, ha happy to start. Again, it, de it depends, but in a general terms, we use the stages of change model uh, in order to judge where young people are in the spectrum. No, if you are in in pre contemplation, you don't you don't know you have a problem. Then we start with recreational activities in order to build the bond and establish a relationship. Mm -hmm. If you are in pre contemplation, then we start having this the activities that you like. Be recreation could be uh, going on field trips, etc. But you start talking about this different things, because in pre-contemplation, you know that you have a problem, but you're not willing to do anything about it. Now, mm. <clears throat> then then, uh, then you go to uh, a stage where you're willing to do something about it, so you, in preparation. So you start, uh, I don't know, if you're gonna do a workforce development program with a young person, you have might have meetings with, uh, with business owners, et cetera, so that they get enthused about the situation. At the same time, we do an assessment of every single young person that we work with to identify risk and protective factors. Mm. So we want to we want to reduce the risk factors. We want to enhance protective factors. Also, we want to know what the impediments for success will be. 
if they have children and they don't have anyone to leave them with. So we want to, to prepare them for success. And then comes action. Now when you get enrolled in the educational supports or, or workforce and employment services, or you go back to school or you start the GED or whatever it is that you, or you're gonna part, be part of a, a soccer league. But we want, by that time, we want to have reduced as many barriers as possible, including the, the personal barriers, no? That's why we yeah. use the stages of change. And then you have the, the physical barriers and we have a case management department that works with the young people and the families uh, to try to reduce those barriers. If you're gonna be evicted, then, and you don't know where you're going to end up, it's hard to, to find someone employment because they might have to move somewhere else. So you have to have a comprehensive approach, again, to look at the, at the state of mind of, of the person in terms of the stages of change. Again, pre-contemplation and contemplation, we do not introduce them to, to programs mm -hmm. because they will probably not be successful and we'd rather put forward someone that will be successful. But after they, they overcome and they're ready, then we work with them and at the same time, we reduce the physical barriers, if you will, uh, in terms of transportation, illness, mm -hmm. whatever that might be, be a case management. Mm -hmm. So that, that gives you an, an overview of how we do it at Identity. Yeah, thank you so much. And I love that you're pointing to specific tools that your organization uses. When our um, audience signs up for this webinar and gives us a little bit of information, lots of times what we find is like people want like the what, like what's the strategy? What are you doing? What's happening? Because we're all kind of grappling. And we know that the runway can be long for supporting young people, but I really like that you said like, hey, here are two specific things. Yes. One is Just using- one, one more thing, Brandy. Yeah, yeah, please. Last stage in the stage of change model is relapse. No, because mm -hmm. these young people will fall, but you don't fall all the way back from when you started. No, you fall and there's knowledge already incorporated. So uh, one of our values is that young people need a lot more than one chance. So uh, no, we, we pick up where they fell and, and we, we start again, but the process tends to be a lot faster. Yes. And recognizing that that is still progress. I love that too. And I was going to say, I love that you name two specific tools that like we recognize there's a long runway. There can be a long runway. I'm sure lots of people on this webinar agree. And two tools that identity has used one stages of change model. And so formally understanding where young people are. And then also assessment two, number two is understanding both risk and protective factors. Because sometimes those things can be going on in a more informal way. It's like, oh, every young person, you know, of course we're creating a relationship. Of course we're seeing what's up. But I really love that you're saying like, no, these are specific parts of our process and we have a way of doing those. And I would assume that also means a lot for how you're working with your team and therefore how the team is working with young people in a strategic way. Yeah, thank you for sharing. And also for Sheree or Alex, anything that you wanted to add to this question? Um, I was gonna, and sorry, I just wanted to add a note. I'm sorry if my um, facial expressions <laughs> during, I was being asked questions by colleagues and I was like, just hold on, sorry. Um, no worries. Um, but anyway, yeah, I, I, I like, you know, Diego, how you mentioned sort of like, you know, creating safe spaces where young people can feel affirmed, valued, understood, and that, you know, they have the ability to fail and have second chances within the context of supportive relationships. I think that's really key um, in our work, in our organization, and Alex can speak, you know, way more to this. Um, but I think we've really focused on um, leadership development and cultivating peer networks in particular. So young people mm -hmm. can build social capital amongst their peers, share experiences, um, you know, learn from one another and really reinforcing their resilience through their community. Um, but I think also, you know, that's our sort of, I think, contribution in a lot of ways um, to the field. But I think we have a lot of amazing grantee partners um, that do, you know, uh, a lot of powerful work um, and use things like, you know, in their service delivery in in really amazing ways that might not see seem like this is like, directly connected, but they find ways to like, you know, do somatic mind body connection work mm. with young people um, and do grounding techniques and talk about coping mechanisms. And, um, and just, I think all of that really is important as we think about a more expansive view of well-being and 
um, you know, helping each other sort of be well um, in all of the spaces that we are um, together. Yeah, thank you so much. Alex, anything for you? Um, I think I would I would underscore the just the power of peer spaces um, and how that can feel like a soft place to land and you don't need to over explain why you're showing up the way that you're showing up. <clears throat> um, and I also, I guess one of the other things, and maybe this feels connected to the second, third, 10th chance, you know, mm -hmm. concept that the way that we have structured our youth leadership network is it's really um, it's like a once a fellow, always a fellow culture. And so that was not to, that was to avoid recreating an, another aging out process, right. Of this mm -hmm. network of people that care about you and that you feel like you belong to. Um, and it also really embodies this culture of like, step back when you need to. And like, we will, mm -hmm. we'll welcome you back with open arms or come find you to say, Hey, we miss you. Um, you know, just depending on where you are in life, like a lot of flexibility around that. Um, and a lot of grace is just like baked into, I think our values and the way that the programs are designed. Um, and then I think, oh, the other thing that I was just going to say was, um, we have trained up other fellows to do this sort of in a peer coach capacity, but our team also um, takes a coaching approach to supporting young people. So, right. That differs a bit from mentoring. It differs from, parenting, teacher, therapist, right? It's it's this non-directive, um, non-judgmental, supportive stance um, to supporting young people. And I think that has felt really important, um, one, so that the young people that we are working with can really stand in their autonomy and their agency, knowing that they've come from a space where a lot of decisions have been made for them that have really impacted their lives, right? And so that was really intentional through the lens of some of the nuances that come with being in foster care and um, just sort of holding that stance, knowing that our goals and our values are around you and your leadership journey um, and wanting to um, support you full stop in, in what that looks like. Yeah. So, Thank Friday, you. one of the things that Alex mentioned really resonates, and this is so basic, but people might not know, but we also, one of the, the, the anchors of Identity's work is the positive youth development model, you know, that sees young people as assets, mm -hmm. assets that need to be nourished and not problems to be fixed. But with simple things, simple things, remembering their names, you know? uh, say, hello, Alex, how are you? knowing when their birthday is and celebrating her birthday, for example, you, I would say that at least 30% of the young people we work with, no one has ever celebrated their birthday. So that is like a, an accelerator towards building trust and, and, and hope the young people. So anyways, I just wanted to, to it's basic, but the, youth develop, the positive youth development model is a phenomenal model to follow and to train staff on in order to do this type of work. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that addition. So now we're going to move on to um, question three, which is about hope. And so you'll see it um, showing up in your chat as well. And I'm just giving it a scroll. Um, also a reminder that we see some questions coming in, continue to drop and share those questions. So um, number three question for our panelists is about hope. So I shared um, in my opening remarks that um, at Community Science, we have um, had a lot of focus lately on hope and just seeing hopefulness, also seeing young people define their own hopefulness. So um, sometimes our programs might focus on one thing, for instance, connection to jobs, and then really what young people are looking for is like, yeah, job is fine, but like what I really want is financial security. I want to have my credit score that's good so that I could have an apartment for myself and my daughter and maybe my mother to come when she needs a soft place to land. And so um, thinking about what is hope, how do young people define them dreams for themselves, and how do we support them? So the question is, considering much of youth-focused work emphasizes challenges and vulnerabilities, how do you center hope in, work, in your work as you balance addressing um, and supporting real-world challenges? Can you provide examples of how fostering hope has led to positive outcomes for young people you, who you work with? Happy to start. Please. So hope it's a process and people develop hope or acquire hope 
doesn't happen. Mm. So what 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 happens naturally is that young people are they face lots of challenges. No, some more than others, some more serious than others. But again, I want to repeat this a thousand times. But we are in the business of developing trustful relationships with them. What happens when you develop a trustful relationship is that this young person no longer feels alone. Uh, so whatever heaviness he or she might be experiencing is shared. It takes time for them to share everything that's happening and everything that happened. But from that minute on, they feel alone. They feel that someone sees them because you communicate. When you build trust, you're not saying, oh, we trust each other. But there's, there's a, a bond that was that was built and people understand, the young people understand that that bond is built based on that this individual sees something in them. And I recognize something in you that you might have not recognized for a long time. So they also, there's a process of rediscovery that I'm worth it. I am, I have potential, uh, you know, I, I can do things. And then come other things that Alex and, and Sherry had said uh, in terms of, they connect with a group of young people whose defenses are low because they're in a trustful environment. So they share some of the experiences and they're no longer alone. Uh, they can be become vulnerable. Being hopeful, to me, great part of it is feeling so safe that you can be vulnerable. The majority of the young people that we work with, when we get to them, they have not been vulnerable for a long, long, long time. And, and then you work, begin to work on a well, uh, on a, a work plan, you no, know, for each one of the young people that are involved themselves and the families. And suddenly they begin to achieve things. You no, know? they re-enroll in school. They might uh, get get their GD or get a job or get get a better job. But throughout throughout that process, you no, know, they feel better and better about themselves. And we have to be very careful as to having the safety net there in case they fall, because many do fall. But again, you do not fall the same place where you started. Sometimes you pick it up and you pick someone up and uh, help them pick up because they do the work. We don't do the work. As we tell them, we do 10% of the work. You have to do 90% of the work. No one can live for anyone. Uh, but again, it's a process. And it starts with building trustful relationships and then provide them with a safe environment in order to, to become vulnerable. And then try to try to those issues that can be solved. And, some things cannot be solved, but at least they understand that they are not, they do not equal the challenges that they're facing. And some of them are not even theirs. So they can set their own futures for themselves. Yes. And speaking of what you were saying is some of the challenges are not theirs. A lot of our work recently, community science has focused on the intersection of systems that young people are facing. So the education system, which is commonly the foundation, because here in this country, we have to go to school legally. But then you also have like the housing system coming in, the child welfare system, the health system, and um, all of those um, kind of hitting together. And that also what you shared also made me think about like how those systems catch young people or don't. And we're finding across multiple projects how much we keep hearing about housing insecurity and housing being such a foundational system um, that it's like, oh, I'm trying to access mental health, but I don't have stable health. It's everything is like a but where if you don't have housing. And for me, um, part of my past work, I came from a housing center, at Urban Institute. So I feel like, again, like I'm not in a housing center, but housing is really bombarding our work as thinking about like, what are the supports? Mm -hmm. The most also, common also, ones. Also, Brandy, the other, I agree hundred percent. In addition, you have, for example, I was speaking with a young person this morning that uh, his mother chooses to be in an abusive relationship. You know? And this, he's tried and tried and tried. And so the message to him was, you cannot control what your mother decides. You just can't. So what are you going to do to have a different future for yourself? You know? so, but for many years, he's tried and tried. And, and he got sucked into, into that, that, that dynamic. And like those, there are many. You know? mm, yeah. I also hear potential housing there because of the connection between who's doing those actions and what that means for who young people might be living with. And I know one of our questions too, a little bit earlier was also about 
like you have couch surfing and you have sort of the informal supports around young people and how do you support that that stuff and I say like to that question we can maybe dig deeper later but to me it's really about supporting the larger systems that are triggering those actions of young people needing to be sleeping in target parking lots couches like all of the things even if they might not be using words like homelessness or housing incident it could just be like in our study we have like this um piece of call like oh I sleep outside like no one's saying like oh I have this it's like literally I, I sleep outside and that could mean lots of things so yeah for sure Diego I want to also um pass to Alex and Sheree yeah I can jump in this I mean this is so connected so there's a couple of things that come up for me. One, I actually cast this question out to a few of our advocates to see how they would respond. Um, and so Maria, Sylvia, Ash, and Anastasia, shout out. Um, and they shared, um, a couple of them actually shared specific but different examples around housing and how important it is to affirm people's dignity through ensuring that their basic needs are met, right? Um, with the understanding, like you're saying, once people, when people's basic needs are met, um, like housing, then people, as another advocate said, have the privilege to dream and can feel yeah. hope restored, right? Um, and so that was, that's just really resonant because that came up. Um, another person really lifted up like the importance of hope being seated in the very act of listening to young people. So this is threaded through this conversation too, right? Like listening to what they're asking for, what they're hoping for, and then following through, right? On whatever mm -hmm. action we can take, sort of restoring hope in people and what it what it feels like to show up for people and to be shown up for, um, I think is is really, really powerful. Um, and then I think about like, like you're saying, um, Brandy, too, just like the interlocking systems of oppression that are hard at work um, in keeping people in a in a in a place of pain and despair and like really makes hope an inaccessible feeling sometimes. Um, and when I think about our youth leadership work, young people are really on this journey of processing their own experiences and their trauma and then mapping that to this bigger world. Right. Mapping that to these structures that are rooted in racism and transphobia and ableism and all of these things, right? Um, and so together in the thick of that journey, I think we find hope in our shared efforts, right? Like hope in learning how to take care of ourselves, knowing that movements are only as strong as the people that are really showing up in them. Um, I've seen people really cultivate hope and find, and like articulate that, right? And articulate, I have found purpose in this advocacy work and I actually have found it to be healing. And I think that's such a beautiful and powerful, really hard thing to measure um, how people sort of experience healing in the context of advocacy work, but it can be, right? To be part of something bigger, to be in community with people that you have shared values with, shared experiences, um, and, and to see an experience change actually happen, to sort of reflect on like the pain, I can actually, wield the painful experiences that I have gone through to create change for others is a really moving experience that many people, and it's not, you know, it's not all butterflies and hope and healing, right? It's like really messy work. Um, but that is something that, um, that comes up a lot that people reflect on. Um, and I think it can really fuel or refuel hope. It certainly does for me. <laughs> like, that's the other thing about sort of this, like being in interdependent relationships, right? Like, there's so many different dimensions, but like being in community with such strong and dynamic young leaders across the country is like also very life-giving for me. And that's important to sustaining my work in the, you know what I mean? So again, I'll stop there, but I really love this question. Thank you. Thank you. Any other shares? Um, I, you know, just to underline and underscore, you know, yeah. totally Alex, I, I feel like um, and from a funding perspective, you know, I think that that's also like a cue for, um, you know, funders to invest in and support youth led organizing efforts and movements mm -hmm. and activism and, you know, and, and also advocacy organizations to like help, you know, cre create space and build the infrastructure for young people to really lead in um, some of our, you know, transformative efforts, because I think, you know, as we talk about um, authentic engagement with young people, and we're asking them to inform and drive decision making, not just about their own lives, but, you know, sharing insights, critiques, and considerations about the systems and the environments that they experience. 
you know, I think, you know, we, when you ask somebody, you know, what they want or what they envision for the future, I think um, putting, you know, your support and money, you know, where your mouth is and, and following through on what they want for their communities is important. And I think investing in that is one way we can, we can do that and really foster hope. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, so we have a final question. Before we take that one, I want to revisit our chat. We've answered one of the questions about um, supporting what looks like housing instability. There's another one in here also about access to physical health, like young people who are um, older youth also commonly folk, um, face major physical health needs in addition to social emotional well-being and how do you make sure that they're getting the access to programs and things that they might need. Anyone um, on the panel want to take that one? As it also mentions, especially considering that some of them might be uninsured, which is a major issue, I believe, across the work that we all do is um, young people who might be uninsured, another cue that young people might not have the supports that they need for mental and physical health. Happy to, to start. So that's why I mentioned before that we do an assessment, no? like a baseline assessment of young people where we talked about, again, all recent project factors. Health is one of them. And uh, we we are in Montgomery County, Maryland. And we are very lucky to have a network of clinics who provide free services to, to clients. Uh, so... Part of what we do once we identify the need is that we work with the case management department in order to to uh, get the young people the service that they need. Um, again, this county has an infrastructure that allows you to do that. It doesn't matter if you're documented or undocumented. Uh, other places, that might be very difficult. And then younger people, 18 and younger, you now get the state's uh, health care. Uh, so that's a, a positive in Maryland, and I don't know about other states. Yeah, but it, it's a key because if you're hurting, then the rest doesn't matter. But if you can, if you can support this young person and a family member get access to healthcare, then the trust has already been built uh, because they know that you delivered. Yeah, thank you so much. Alex or Sheree, anything else? I'll, I'll just weigh in by acknowledging that this is not my lane. Um, and I could also share, there's a couple organizations that are in our network that have really focused on ensuring young people in foster care have dental care and dental insurance, because that's a huge gap. Um, and I can also share, I mean, there's a lot of work right around Medicaid and foster care and ensuring that young people don't fall through those re-enrollment gaps. Um, and I don't know, Sheree, if you want to mention anything else, I know there's a growing conversation around Medicaid and sort of thinking about me Medicaid, thinking about the sort of expansive ways that it can really support young people and families beyond, I mean, in it, like around things like housing, other social determinants of health. Um, yeah, I'll stop. I don't know, Sheree, if you want to jump in on that. Yeah, I mean, a huge topic. Um, and so, but I think, you know, really related to this conversation, because I think, you know, really at the at the core, we're talking about like well-being, and there are many different domains of well-being, right, like physical health, um, and well-being, right, social and emotional, economic, mm -hmm. um, and, and also shout out to the Youth Transition Funders Group, which put out a um, resource, it's called the Well-Being and Well-Becoming Framework. Um, and that is, I feel like a really helpful sort of like organizing um, framework to guide transformational investments and initiatives toward the well-being of young people. Um, but so there's a con growing conversation, I think, that's been happening among youth serving systems around how we sort of better um, utilize Medicaid and specifically the children's behavioral health part of Medicaid, which is a legal entitlement entitlement for children to like have what they need to be healthy. Um, and I don't think we've really fully uh, like realized it to its full extent and potential. And so there are recommendations being made to, um, you know, remove the diagnostic criteria, for example, around how people access services and to use federal waivers um, to do some of that work 
and to add new provider types um, to manage care contracts and state plans so that um, non-traditional support, right? Like we think of talk therapy as like one of the main forms of like behavior, mm -hmm. mental and behavioral health, but like there are a lot of more holistic types of like um, support and healing that people could access if the systems really prioritized that and were incentivized to allow service providers to do that type of work. And I think one cool example that comes to mind is like in Canada, there's I think nine providences right now where like doctors can write prescriptions for people to to spend time in nature and therefore get free access to parks, right? Mm. Um, so yeah, just like thinking about how we structure systems um, to really promote well-being um, and do that work, you know, collaboratively because it's no one system's responsibility. It's, you know, a collective responsibility and we all have to work together to make that happen. Great. Thank you so much. And um, we only have about four minutes left. The conversation has been so great. So we're going to run multiple trains as one at once. Andrea, can you please prepare to show our final slide, which shows some other upcoming webinar opportunities. And while Andrea, um, our facilitator here, does that, I'm also going to ask each panelist to just share any parting words. So this is really our question for as much as you can dig into it in 30 seconds. Is looking ahead, what do you believe are the most critical elements of building the most resilient, equitable supports for young people, particularly as we face growing uncertainty and stress? How can community organizations and funders best collaborate to create sustainable long-term change with and for youth? So that was many things. Feel free to take whatever pieces you kind of want to run with in your closing remarks. I can run really quick. I think you said oh, the yeah. last part of what you said, Brandy, like with young people is probably what I would look uh, lift up as a real important equity strategy is underscoring partnering with people with the lived experiences that you are seeking to support or change um, and doing it well in a really reciprocal way, in a really authentic way where it's not just people coming in to support the organization to do better, but that it's a reciprocal relationship. Um, yeah, I'll just full stop there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, maybe also, it's. I think uh, Casey does a phenomenal job at doing that, but also having conversations no, about the invisible work between the funders and fundees, no, about what, what it really takes, uh, because some sources of funding are a little bit blind, blind and only one directional. I say, here's X number of dollars to do this but without having a conversation about what it really takes and what can or cannot be done with those resources. And I will bring the young people to the, to the, to the <laughs> conversations as well. Yeah. Thank you so much. Sheree, final word. Oh man, that's, that's too <laughs> difficult, but I, I agree. I agree with both of my panelists and I think, yeah, just, you know, authentically, you know, being in relationship with people and, uh, you know, finding ways to, um, really lift up the the value of this work and the impact of it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, tremendous thanks to our panelists. Thank you all who joined us today and um, stayed for this exciting and important discussion of working alongside young people and in support of them. Um, thank you for all the words of wisdom and lessons learned for our panels that you all have offered. We also shared in the chat a link to other upcoming webinars and opportunities to join us for other impactful conversations. Our colleagues are sharing a webinar tomorrow on community power building. And then our youth focus team also has two more webinars all coming up before um, mid-November-ish about um, practice to policies um, for youth focus work and then our webinar on intergenerational community advisory boards. We're going to have some members of our board there including one of our youth um, members talking about their experiences. So please join us for future opportunities to talk and thank you again to everyone for being here today. <laughs>